Maro off to the side today? Yeah, he just, we just want to be careful with him right now. Uh, you know, he was pretty crushed after the weekend in Dallas and, uh, you know, feels a little bit of a tinge. Uh, nothing serious or bad in his quad yet, so we're just, you know, just being cautious. Same thing, because we have a little bit of time right now, and we're going to have a tough stretch again. And certainly, he's an important player for us. So sometimes in the past with him, when he's had a little thing, and we've tried to push through it, it's become a bigger thing. And so we just want to be careful about that. And about Ozzy, yeah. Ozzy looked like he was active, but also maybe holding. Yeah, Ozzy, we just held. I I held him out of the 11 v 11. I said he was going to do everything until the 11 v 11. Uh, he wanted to play, and I said, no, it's not a choice. So, you know, he's been cleared and everything, and he's uh, he's been okayed. Uh, but I just wanted to up-train him a little bit, have him do a little bit more today, make sure there's no setback going in tomorrow. But I expect Ozzy to be ready on Saturday. How many stitches did he end up getting, do you know? Uh, I think six, six or seven, something like that. Yeah. Six? six seven. Yeah, six sounds <laughs> right. Yeah. Six, seven, roll the dice. Okay. I mean, does that affect guys if they have a wound? that's being sewn up on their head? Uh, you know, it depends sometimes. I mean, if you get if you get your cut uh, right above the eyebrow or something like that, you get cut there, then and you're a central defender, it becomes an issue going up for headers, you know, the next week and so forth. Uh, even if you get it wrapped up and they put all the Vaseline on, it's still got a chance of opening up again where he's gotten it. Uh, you know, is he he's, he's not going to head the ball there unless the ball hits him there. So we, we've got to see how he feels about heading. That's something we'll touch upon tomorrow, you know. But guys have had it. Ezra Ezra had a similar one where he just played with like a skull cap, you know, when he had he had like four or five stitches as well, about Is the same on spot. The top, top of his head then? It's like between the ear and the top of the head, about two thirds up. Yeah. Human nature says we scored six on these guys the last time. They've given up 13 in three games. We show up, we win. Is it danger, danger? We can't trust human nature. Then <laughs> you know, is uh, it the most, you know, most important thing uh, in games like that is is you can't look at the past one as a predictor of the future. Everyone is a every game is a separate occurrence. You know, is mutually exclusive from the past, <clears throat> and that's the way we have to approach it. You know, just because they had a bad game against us in L.A. doesn't mean they're going to have a bad game here. In fact, they're going to be highly motivated. Uh, mathematically, they're, they're still a team that has a shot at the playoffs if they can get their games in hand and get the points out of their games in hand. Uh, so they're, they're the same as they were in L.A. They're still a very dangerous team. We should have confidence based upon our L.A. experience, uh, but confidence means that you still got to work hard. Switching gears a little bit to working on future for Andy Rose, I mean, can you just talk a little bit about um, you know what his profession, past professional experience did in terms of helping him transition to MLS? Uh, I mean, you know, when you're looking at his time at Bristol, you mean where... Yeah, I mean, yeah, he was a professional. But. Yeah, I mean, you know, all those is, is, you know, it's different. You grow up overseas and, and you're with, uh, you know, you're with an academy program of a professional club. Uh, you know, you're around the pros, you know, you see all that, you know, you're in the stadium, you you sort of aspire to that, you know, and it's, uh, you know, you don't always, I mean, you're now getting those opportunities in the United States, uh, but in the past, sometimes you didn't have those opportunities in the United States. And I think as a impressionable young player, uh, you always look at the guys a little bit above you and you form some idols and some guys that you see at training or whatever and you say, hey, I'd like to pick up some of his habits or those are positive things that he does. And so he had those exposures when he was young and I think that that helps him. But, uh, you know, he's, he's had good parents. He's got a good upbringing, uh, you know, and in regards to his, his work ethic is very solid. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, if you have some talent and you've got a good work ethic, you're going to go far. If you have talent and you have no work ethic, sometimes you don't go very far. Would you say you notice a difference between him and an average rookie uh, right away? Or? Um, coming in, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it, I don't know. It's like I said when we first, when we didn't draft him at the initiative, and it was one of the guys that I said, man, I think we should have drafted him. I just always thought that his approach, you know, when he trained with us uh, in the one summer, that his approach was always very positive, very professional, uh, you know, that he listened, that he learned, that he tried to take on board what you told him. And, uh, and I thought over his years at UCLA, his game improved every year. And that's something that you look for in players as well. So I think it's more seeing that uh, than anything else that, uh, 
uh, I think was there. And then when he came in, even though it was frustrating for him and he wasn't getting time with the first team just playing with the reserves, he just he just kept working, 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 working and, and decided, hey, I'm gonna make I'm gonna be the best player on the reserve team and and make myself noticeable and that's what he did and that's why he moved up. What what is kind of your role with the the, the coaching clinic that's going on and, and just kind of your, you know, <clears throat> having reached a status in the profession where you kind of have an obligation or something to, to, to say for the next generation of coaches? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, the role is really the club's role, you know, in terms of, of the interaction and the cooperation that exists between the Sounders and, and Washington Youth Soccer. You know, I think that's a bond and a tie uh, that has to exist, uh, you know, and has to be strong because, you know, even though there's not a ton of players they're going to get from Washington youth soccer into the pro level. It's still something for them to look up to and it's something for them to emulate. And it's also something for them that uh, that is also motivating uh, as well. And so my role with all this, uh, you know, we were t I was talking the other night to some friends and, you know, we were saying, oh, you achieve us, you know, playing against an old teammate of mine. And, you know, and I said, yeah, and the guy I used to coach and the assistant coach I used to coach and the technical director I used to coach. <laughs> and I go, geez, um, I'm very old now. But, uh, you know, I, I think my role is just, uh, you know, that if I can if I can help a young coach, if you say something, sometimes something sticks. You remember something, you carry it with you. You know, Jimmy Gabriel. Uh, who is older than me? I, I, you know, some people <laughs> don't believe that, <clears throat> but Jimmy is older than me, and and I remember coming up here when he was when I really got to know him when he was working with Dean Wurtzberg at University of Washington. He's the one who gave me the phrase "serious fun," and it was always something that I kept with me. And uh, you know, Manny Shellshide, who I had some interaction with, who you know coached Seton Hall on the East Coast and was sort of the guru to to uh, Bob Bradley and to Bruce Arena. One of the things we talked about, I called him up once and talked about how do I get more leadership out of players. And, uh, you know, he was saying, well, you know, you know, and we were talking about a player in particular. And he said, well, you're not going to get more leadership out of him. And I go, why? He says, because he's too busy having to worry about controlling the ball. And so he, his technique's not good enough. He doesn't have time to lead. He goes, now this player, he gave another player's example. Technically, he's very good. Tactically, he understands the game. So he has lots of time to boss other people around because he sees that. And then we talked about development of players. And he goes, it's like child development. You, when you're young, it's, it's you're just worried about controlling the ball. Then you worry about, oh, there's an opponent there. And so you worry about the ball and the opponent. And then at the next phase, all of a sudden, now you're worrying about the ball, the opponent, and where's my teammate? And then it's, oh, and where's the second opponent? And, and that's how your game expands and your horizon expands and it was just a good way to explain the evolution of teaching you know as you teach young players and you move up so so every coach leaves you with something that hopefully you remember and as one of my old players said who's coaching in, in Florida now he says you know I use some of the stuff you you've said you know I said good so actually some of the crap stuck and uh, <clears throat> and now you're using it but it's it's you try and pass that on but I think observing trainings is something that coaches don't do enough of okay and and uh, you know our trainings are open people can come and and they can observe them for the most part and uh, you know it's the thing I did as a young coach I mean I I found different ways if I knew Argentina was playing a friendly in in the Coliseum on the weekend I figure out where they were training I try and see if I knew somebody who could get me in you know my buddy of mine worked at, at the sports arena so he would know somebody and he'd get me into a training that was closed and I could see them train I could see Bellardo train and I was able to see a guy like uh, Rivik from Germany train or, or or Maldini train his team when he was the Italian coach and you know I've seen all those people and I think observing trainings uh, you know watching the Lakers you know practice for a lot of years uh, you know watching uh, you know wouldn't work with the basketball team observing trainers or coaches in training sessions and observing training sessions uh, there's a benefit to that that is uh, over and beyond what you get out of coaching schools coaching schools are just a, a common language to discuss the game with each other as coaches but you don't talk that way to players and it also gives you like a base of knowledge it's just like uh, you know your base education but at the end your real experiences are what you can learn by observing and and not enough coaches observe training I always made the statement I know it's a long answer right now but I made a statement when I was when I was the assistant coach with the US World Cup team and we're training in Mission Viejo how few coaches came up and watched us train you know college coaches that would never come and the way I met Bora is because when he first took the team and he was coaching in the Gold Cup in 91 I was I was out at Dominguez watching every training session 
and eventually Bore, you know, and some of the guys, because I knew Caligari and Murray, and, and the guys would say hello to me, and eventually Bore said to Caligari, who is this guy? You know, and Caligari goes, oh, that's my coach, Ziggy. He goes, no, if it's your coach, it's Mr. Ziggy. You know, so, <laughs> <clears throat> so then he made Paul introduce me to him, and we started talking, you know, and, and that's probably what helped me eventually become an assistant to him. But I was there every day because I just wanted to see what his training was like, what his rhythm was like, how he interacted with players, when he stopped things. Those are things you don't get out of coaching. Great. Thank so, you. Long answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> what have you seen from uh, Eddie and Freddie maybe if the club brings in a you know, world, former world-class striker, world-class striker? You know, have you seen anything different from them? No, I mean, you know, I mean, we're looking to win a championship this year, and if we can make our team a little bit stronger, you know, we're going to try and make our team a little bit stronger. We never leave any stones unturned. I think they know that, uh, you know, and, but they're also, they've been very prolific this year, you know. Eddie's done a good job. He's got 11 goals. You know, Freddie, I think over the four years now, is, is the second highest goal scorer in the league. Uh, you know, over four years, he's got 10 goals or more in each of the four seasons. So he's been very consistent as well. Uh, you know, those guys are there, but we still have games. We still have two CONCACAF games in there. We still have some midweek games. We still have game series where we play three games in a week. Uh, you, you always want to make sure you avoid injuries. You don't know what's going to happen, but uh, having, having quality players on your team is never a detriment. You guys uh, had mentioned after the Chivas game that you weren't happy with the defensive effort. What, what do you guys need to see this time around on this Chivas? Well, we need to do a better job in terms of marking people in the box. I think we lost people in the penalty box, uh, you know, on crosses and a, a number of occasions. And so that's something that, you know, right now we've talked about. We really didn't train on it, on it specifically. We'll train on it maybe a little bit tomorrow, almost like a walkthrough. But it's important that we get tight to people and that we don't allow people to float off of us by two, three yards. And the second part of that equation is we got to make sure we get out and block crosses and not allow, allow uh, you know, unnecessary crosses into the box. But part of it we can't control because part of it is, you know, they need to get three points a game. And so at times they're going to cheat and they're going to take risks and they're going to let people sit forward. And that's something we can't control. Give your full 90 with the Sounders FC mobile app featuring live audio, match day blog and much more to keep you connected. Download your app at soundersfc.com mobile.